Hello everyone, Tim Nguyen here. Today I'm making a special video covering DeepMind's latest breakthrough using AI to advance mathematics. Being an employee at DeepMind, let me first say that this is not an official DeepMind product. That being said, DeepMind's result stands quite distinctly from past approaches using machines to assist mathematics. And here's why. So as a former academic mathematician, let me first describe to you what research mathematics is like. What mathematicians are really interested in are coming up with interesting theorems and proofs. And so while a computer may assist with computations or help with running experiments, the bulk of the work consists in coming up with creative steps that eventually lead to the solution of a problem. And it's really this creative aspect that drives mathematicians to do mathematics. And so one should really think of a mathematician as an inspired artist with a computer uh, typically being merely a convenient time-saving tool. On the other end of the spectrum, there is a dream of building a machine that can automate the steps of proving a theorem. Indeed, it would be amazing if we could pass to a machine a statement like the Riemann hypothesis and have it return for us a proof of its truth or falsity. However, uh, speaking from experience, most mathematicians aren't that enthusiastic or at least not engaged with automated theorem proving. At worst, these machines might never match the ingenuity of working mathematicians, and at best, they might put mathematicians out of a job. Uh, so it's like asking an artist uh, what they think of an AI that can generate paintings or novels. The computer scientist might be enthusiastic, but possibly not so much the artist. So what DeepMind did was to leverage the best of both worlds. Mathematics gets breakthrough results, but only through the insights gained through machine learning. What we have is a much more egalitarian relationship emerging between mathematician and machine. It's not just a program doing brute force verification for a mathematician, nor is it a program simply yielding a formal proof without further input from a mathematician. What we have is that mathematician and machine are now a team. And so what I'd like to do in this uh, video is to describe both the math and the machine learning uh, re uh, behind the DeepMind result in such a way that persons from either community uh, can walk away with a better understanding of the ideas involved. So there are actually two results in the DeepMind paper, one in knot theory and one in representation theory, but in the interest of time, I'll only be going over the knot theory result. I'll first start off by providing some mathematical background on the knot theory, and then I'll discuss some of the basics of machine learning and see how it was used to obtain new and significant mathematical results. Okay, so let's first begin by going over some knot theory basics. Let's first begin by defining what a knot is. So a knot is a very simple concept. A knot is simply an embedding of the circle into three-dimensional space. And when I say embedding, I mean a smooth embedding, okay? So let's look at some examples of what I mean. So the simplest example is just, say, uh, what you think of as an ordinary circle sitting in three-dimensional space. And uh, we call this the unknot, okay? Here, unknot refers to the fact that there's no um, uh, complicated twisting or interleaving of any sort. Um, actually, I should clarify, when I say embedding, I also mean something else very important, which is that there's no self-intersection. Okay? So embedding uh, means that uh, everywhere, uh, you, when you look at the circle very closely, it looks like an interval, right? A little piece of the circle uh, uh, looks like a, a segment, essentially. And so when you uh, map it into R3, it should also look like a segment locally, okay? So you can't have something that, uh, you know, actually intersects itself like a figure eight. So you, you, you don't want that. Okay, so this is not allowed. Okay, so we have one example of a knot, which is this unknot. Let's look at a more interesting example. And the first uh, example of a knot that's uh, not the unknot would be uh, the trefoil. So I'm not a knot theorist, so it's a little difficult for me to draw this. 
but okay. The rule is you go over and then under and then over again. Okay, so this is what mathematicians call a trefoil knot. Okay, and in what sense are these two knots uh, in equivalent? Well, the notion of equivalence is the following. Two knots are equivalent uh, if one can be smoothly uh, deformed uh, by embeddings into uh, the other, right? So in other words, you're allowed to move the knot around so long as it maintains this embedding property. There's no self-intersection, okay? And if you sort of stare at this picture, it, it seems reasonable that, that this trefoil isn't equivalent to the unknot, right? You can imagine um, the trefoil being an actual uh, piece of rope tied up like that. And it looks somehow uh, twisted in such a way that you can't disentangle it into the unknot uh, short of um, uh, doing some kind of self-intersection or some cutting up and regluing, right? So one way in which you can uh, uh, make the trefoil into the unknot is if you did the following. What if I, for example, uh, took this region over here, right, which uh, there is the strand that's on top and then there's the strand at the bottom. What if I pulled the bottom strand, the pulled the bottom strand above the upper strand, right? And so what if I did some procedure where I now transform this trefoil knot into following where now I have over, um, under, and now over, right? What if I did that? Then uh, what you can do now is you can deform this into the unknot. So this is secretly the unknot. Why? Because you can imagine taking sort of this part of the knot and sort of push that piece of the knot upwards, right? Um, what you're gonna get is something that looks like, let's see, it's a little bit hard to draw here, but you should get something like a figure eight, right? So I, I take this uh, part I uh, circled in blue, I use my finger, I push it upwards, Right, and then I'm going to get something that looks like a figure eight. And then I can just take this uh, part of the knot and just move it towards the left. And now it's gonna look like the unknot, right? Any, any two circles can be uh, deformed into the other uh, without any tearing or, or, or cutting and, and regluing. okay? So you, you see that if I were allowed to move knots in such a way that I allow for crossings to happen, then I can deform the trefoil into the unknot, but I'm not allowed to do that, okay? I'm not allowed to do any uh, self-intersection when I do this moving around. So once you introduce that notion of uh, when two knots are equivalent by adding this constraint that you could only move them through embeddings, um, that makes knot theory rich because indeed there are um, many inequivalent knots, and we just uh, I just showed you two right here. The unknot is one of is one of them, and the trefoil is another. Okay, so this naturally leads to the question of when do we know when two knots are equivalent? So, for example, I told you that the trefoil wasn't equivalent to the unknot, but how do you know that, right? You uh, maybe there's some interesting way to move knots around that you hadn't considered, and if you just tried harder, maybe you can. Um, move the trefoil into the unknot. Another problem is that you can draw knots in um, arbitrarily complicated ways and uh, it's not clear whether you just took a simple knot and drew it uh, in a way that made it look uh, very much different. So for example, we know that uh, we have the unknot that I drew like this, but another way to draw the unknot is to introduce um, uh, arbitrarily many crossings, which I can do by just doing something like the following, right? <clears throat> so that's really another uh, way to embed the unknot because all I have to do is just move this horizontal part of the knot, push it downwards, 
and then uh, what am I going to get? And then I'm just going to uh, get something that looks like that. And then that, again, it's just the unknot, right? Because I can clearly deform these two into each other. So just looking at the intersections um, is not, uh, it could be misleading, okay? So in general, it can be very hard to tell when two knots are equivalent just because you can make one knot arbitrarily uh, complicated by just adding sort of these uh, spurious uh, twists and turns, so to speak. So how are we going to answer this question when uh, we can draw, uh, when we have so many different kinds of knots? Okay, so then the solution is to introduce what are known as knot invariants. So what do I mean by the term um, knot invariant? So the idea is the following. We're going to define a function okay, from the set of knots. And it's going to assign to each knot some kind of object. It could be a number, it could be a polynomial. Just some well-defined object. Okay. And the point is the following, that if F assigns different objects to two different knots, so K1 and K2 are different knots, then if these values are different, then we can conclude that K1 and K2 are inequivalent. Okay. So what a knot invariant is, is that if two knots are secretly the same knot, right, up to this um, notion that we mentioned, that one can be deformed to another, then this F should be able to detect that because it will assign the same number to those two knots. Okay. So, so if I apply F to this uh, knot and F to that knot, I should get the same object. And if I don't get the same object, then that's a way for me to detect that they are indeed different. And the point is that the more knot invariants we have and the more powerful our knot invariants have, then we have more tools with which to distinguish knots. So, so the more um, invariants we have, and more powerful invariants, then uh, we're better able to distinguish uh, more knots. Okay, so this is why mathematicians are interested in coming up with all kinds of knot invariants. The more knot invariants you have, then the more tools you have in your toolkit. Okay, maybe just a pause. Why should we care about uh, knots at all? Well, it's very natural for mathematicians um, to classify things once they've introduced a definition of an object. So we've introduced a notion of a knot, and it just becomes uh, an interesting problem just to classify all of them, just to list the whole uh, zoology. And that's uh, an active area of mathematics research. Uh, but just to list some areas outside of mathematics, you can also care about knots uh, in terms of physics. Um, what happens, say, in uh, two-dimensional condensed matter physics is that you have particles that uh, live in a plane, and then if you add time, then their world lines can sweep out um, interesting behavior in terms of how those world lines uh, intertwine with each other. And based on um, uh, the way these, these uh, what are called braids, so braids are, you can think of them as, as you know, knots with multiple strands, essentially. Uh, based on how these uh, braids uh, intertwine with each other, that, that affects the physics, okay? So it, it does become important um, uh, how these objects are embedded, just like uh, with knots. And then there's also uh, biology, because you can look at the same phenomenon with, say, DNA, right? So DNA has this double helix structure, and uh, locally, um, when enzymes start acting on the DNA, they can uh, introduce uh, knots. And, 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 um, and that's also why knot theory becomes important for biology.
Okay, but that's just uh, that's just an aside just to maybe motivate why you should care about knots. Let's get back to the knot theory. What I'd like to do now is to ask basically the question that motivated the knot theory results in the DeepMind paper, okay? So let's ask, what is this? Um, let's present the fundamental question that motivated the, the knot theory work. Okay, so there are different kinds of knot invariants. They come in different families. There are so-called algebraic ones and geometric ones, uh, and they look very different. And you can ask, is there a relationship between the two? Okay, so the question we're going to ask is, um, is there a relationship between algebraic uh, knot invariants and uh, geometric ones. So what do I mean by that? So algebraic ones, well actually let's, let's just describe geometric first. So geometric means that you're going to introduce, well, some geometry, some notion of measurement, what's called a metric or connection. So, uh, okay, so the definition of a knot just involved uh, topology essentially, how the knot sits in space and you can you know, deform the knot, and uh, we don't care about lengths or angles, okay? Geometric invariants are one that introduce some auxiliary structures that will detect those uh, geometric uh, structures, and that's that's why they're geometric invariants. We'll look at um, them shortly. And then algebraic ones are ones essentially doing with um, how the knot uh, uh, looks like basically in space in terms of the number of crossings that it has, right? So um, that's why they're called algebraic because you're basically looking at uh, sort of the way uh, the knot is presented to you, okay? So sort of, but it doesn't require any uh, of these uh, geometric uh, structures in addition. So I should say that it's really question number two that led to this investigation. Uh, prior to the DeepMind result, the world of algebraic invariants and geometric invariants are uh, completely uh, different worlds. They, the, the communities are different, the techniques are different, and uh, the basic question was, is there a bridge? Is there a relationship between these different ways of understanding knots? And that's actually what led to the DeepMind breakthrough, that indeed uh, what was found is a relationship between uh, algebraic and geometric invariants, which we'll see shortly. Uh, but before we do that, let me first give uh, an example of a knot invariant. I realize I hadn't even uh, given you one to, to begin with. Uh, the simplest one that uh, exists essentially is what's called the crossing number. I'm going to find as follows. So the crossing number of a knot is the minimal number of crossings that you can um, uh, draw for the knot, essentially, okay? So, for example, uh, a knot is the unknot uh, if and only if the crossing number is zero, right? Uh, because uh, if you have no crossings, then essentially you're just like a circle, right? You're, you're, you're something that can be uh, deformed into a circle. Okay, but uh, of course, the knot might not be given that way. Uh, you um, uh, the reason why this is the reason why this definition isn't a trivial definition is that you can't always just read off the minimal number of crossings uh, from the diagram that's presented. Right? We saw earlier that you can draw the unknot with a bunch of turns like this. Right? And here we have uh, three crossings. Right? So one, two, three. And nevertheless, uh, that's not the minimal number of crossings that this knot has because we can uh, find an equivalent knot with uh, zero crossings, right? We just, uh, we just move this um, horizontal part above or below, and then we get no crossings, okay? Uh, the trefoil knot that we drew earlier, right here, its crossing number is three, right? Because we have uh, the first crossing, the second crossing, and the third crossing. Okay, uh, a crossing is just whenever you have an upper and a lower strand. Okay, it doesn't matter um, which one is above or below, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a crossing in, in the intuitive sense you, uh, of, of the word. Okay, so so the crossing uh, uh, number uh, is uh, a knot invariant. 
okay? Because uh, almost by definition, because it's the minimal number of crossings, then it doesn't depend on how you draw the particular knot. It, it says that uh, look at all the spaces of deformations and choose the one that has the fewest number of crossings and uh, that count will be the crossing number of the knot. Okay, and it's also a uh, algebraic invariant because, well, it only depends on the, di on the knot diagram, okay? It doesn't depend on any uh, auxiliary geometric structures, uh, no notion of measurement. Okay, so now I'd like to cover two of the most salient knot invariants that will appear in the DeepMind result. So the first is known as the signature of a knot, okay. and it's an algebraic invariant. And how is it defined? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take our knot, we're going to assign to it a symmetric matrix, and given a symmetric matrix, there is a notion of a signature, namely the number of uh, positive eigenvalues minus the number of negative eigenvalues, right? It's a standard linear algebraic quantity, and uh, we just assign it to this matrix that we assign to the knot. Okay, so that, in a nutshell, is how the signature of a knot is defined. Okay, and the other important knot invariant that we're going to get is what's called the slope of a knot. Okay, and it's only defined for knots that are so-called uh, hyperbolic. So here, K is hyperbolic. Okay, it's, a, it's a notion coming from geometry. Well, we'll see in a second how uh, that comes into play. Okay, so how do we define the slope? So... Okay, well, the mathematical notation is a slope, and, and it's called slope. Uh, what is it? So, um, so we start with our knot. What we're going to do is we're going to assign to it a torus, okay? and a torus is just a mathematician's uh, uh, name for what we ordinarily call the surface of a donut. So torus is just a surface with a hole in it, essentially. Okay, So that's what a torus looks like. Uh, how are we getting this torus? Well, it's coming from something called a maximal cusp. And this is where this hyperbolic geometry comes in. So this is some uh, quite fancy and sophisticated geometry. We uh, won't have the time to go into the details, but uh, I will uh, describe how this torus uh, gives us the notion of a slope. Okay, and that's this number that we're going to get uh, out of this torus. Okay, so the slope is a pretty important concept, so I do want to go into a little bit of detail. But the important point is that given a knot which is hyperbolic, there is this uh, geometric invariant that comes out of the geometry of this uh, associated torus. Okay, and, and what is that? Okay, so let me first describe how we ought to think about this torus. So a torus can be thought of as a parallelogram with opposite sides identified. So I'll draw the parallelogram as follows. It will have one of its edges uh, along the real axis, uh, which I'll denote by uh, this number lambda. So lambda is a positive real number. And then it's given by another vector, which I'll call mu for this other edge here. And the way in which we're going to um, modify this parallelogram is by gluing together opposite sides as follows. Okay, So the two uh, horizontal edges get glued, and then the these two other, um, so th these two green ones get glued together, and these other ones get uh, glued together. And that's how we get a torus. Okay, and if you haven't seen this, this is how you should think about it. So uh, when we say glue the green, uh, or let's say if we glue the orange edges together, then we're going to get this tube-like uh, shape, right? So that's what we get when we take this parallelogram and just uh, fold it and glue. And then finally, uh, when we uh, glue the green edges, then we get the, the surface of a donut, right? Because then we just, we just take the tube and then we just take the top part and then glue it um, to the bottom part, okay? So here with the orange sides identified, 
And then now finally we glue the green together. Okay, fairly standard construction, uh, but that's how you get a torus from uh, a parallelogram. Okay, and what is the data that we use to specify this parallelogram? Well, it was the lambda in R plus, and for this vector mu, let's think of the plane as the complex numbers, and then mu should be a complex number with positive imaginary part. So mu is a complex number, and since our parallelogram sits in the upper half plane, its imaginary part is positive. Okay. So we have this solid region here. Okay, and how are we going to define the slope from this uh, parallelogram? So the slope is defined as follows. Right, so our knot gives us this torus. This torus gives us a lambda and a mu. And the slope is defined as the real part of lambda over mu, okay, which we can also rewrite as the real part, uh, sorry, as lambda times the real part of mu divided by the norm squared of mu, okay, since lambda is real. How should we think about this slope? This slope essentially measures uh, how much the torus uh, twists, right? So uh, how should we think of it? Well, imagine if I uh, send an orthogonal trajectory here, so orthogonal to the uh, x-axis in this diagram, or orthogonal to the, to the curve uh, generated by this uh, lambda uh, vector along the real axis, right? If I go orthogonal to it, I'm going to wind back uh, somewhere along the torus. And where do I wind back? Well, um, I'm going to end up somewhere, say, um, let me just draw it over here, right? Uh, the reason I end up there uh, is because uh, implicit in this gluing diagram, I identify two points if they differ by some multiple of mu and lambda. That's precisely what it means for, for, to do this gluing, right? So precisely if z prime equals uh, z plus, say, some a times lambda plus b times mu. Okay? For example, the reason why we glue these two opposite edges here is because, for example, these two corresponding points, they differ by uh, mu, right? And likewise, the um, points opposite here differ by lambda. Okay, this picture is getting a little bit messy, but as you can see, if you're going to uh, identify points by whether they differ by some multiple of lambda and mu, then when we go perpendicular, Right? We have to add some multiple of lambda or mu for us to wind back in this parallelogram, this so-called uh, fundamental domain. Okay, So we have another copy of this, say, parallelogram over here. Uh, but we identify it with the, the, the main one that we drew at the start because we can just translate it by some mu and lambda. Uh, you know, this, this parallelogram over here right, can be identified with the points of the first parallelogram if we just translate. And so this point here just gets translated to some other uh, point over there. And the way you can think about it in, in sort of uh, th this picture is what are you really doing um, if you don't end back up right where you are, right? Because one way of, of sending a trajectory orthogonally is if you just kind of go around and just end up right where you were. But if the parallelogram isn't right angled, it looks a bit twisted like in, in this picture here, then what you really sort of did is you twisted this tube before you glued back up, right? So you can imagine having this torus here where you go around, but instead of just um, gluing top to bottom straightforwardly, you add a little twist, right? You just add a little twist and then you glue. And if you add a little twist before you glue, then you see that the, um, the two uh, blue uh, segments won't line up. 
And that's exactly sort of what's going on uh, over here, right? When, when the real part of lambda, or sorry, when the real part of mu isn't equal to zero. Okay? So that's the sense in which the slope of this torus measures how twisted it is. It measures um, uh, how far this uh, perpendicular segment deviates uh, when it, when it um, goes back around, so to speak. Okay, and so just to uh, finish our thought on the slope, we can also say that the slope is zero if and only if the uh, torus is right angled. Right? So only if our torus sort of looks like this. In which case when you I'm sorry, I messed up my coloring scheme here, but if you if you go uh, perpendicular like this, then you, you end up back where you started. Okay, so now that we've discussed uh, knot theory, uh, I'll be providing a very quick crash course in machine learning so we can uh, understand the machine learning aspects of the DeepMind result. Okay, so sort of all the rage that's happening with uh, machine learning right now is... Um, uh, taking place through what are known as neural networks. So we'll get to uh, some examples of them in a second, but let me describe at a high level why neural networks are so fundamental. So the first reason we care about neural networks is that they are basically function uh, approximators, or in, uh, in our case, they're going to be... Uh, classifiers. Okay. So in other words, what a neural network is, it's a function depending on some parameters theta. Okay. And it takes some input x. And in the case of function approximation, we're supposed to get a number, or say a, a real value. Or in the case of a prediction problem, we're going to get some uh, categorical prediction. So either we predict uh, some value, maybe the price of a, of a stock, or we're going to predict uh, what type of object something is, whether an image is a cat or a dog. So that distinguishes the cases whether we're doing um, function approximation or classification, whether we get a real valued output or uh, a categorical prediction. Okay, and okay, so that's what a neural network is going to do for us, and the way in which we um, obtain a neural network is that we're going to learn these parameters theta. So theta is just a, a symbol that represents many parameters, millions, billions, possibly now even trillions of parameters. These neural networks can get uh, very large in many cases. Uh, not in the particular case we're going to focus on, but uh, they can be quite large. And so we're going to learn theta uh, using labeled data. So in other words, we're going to train or teach our neural network from our data. Maybe this is a little abstract if you haven't seen this before, so let's quickly look at uh, some standard examples. So for example, there's a well-known MNIST data set consisting of uh, digit images, okay? so. The input X is a 28 by 28 grayscale image, which we can think of as a vector in R28 cross 28. So here's a 28 by 28 image, and it will have some digit on it, let's say a seven. Okay, and uh, when we say labeled data, it means that we know um, what label that image uh, uh, comes with, right? So the label which we call Y is just some element from uh, 0, 1 all the way to 9, okay? The 10 different digits. So it's, it's a 10-way classification problem. Each image can be one of 10 classes. Okay, and so with this data set, what one hopes is to uh, take this neural network, uh, show it a bunch of examples of what um, digits look like, and hopefully uh, it will learn the concept of, of a digit. When you feed it uh, a new digit that it hasn't seen, 
uh, hopefully it will make a correct prediction. That's, that's the goal of, of training a neural network on this data set. In our example, so for not theory, the input we're going to um, feed to the neural network is that x is going to be a uh, it's going to be a vector of not invariance, right? So there's a whole host of all kinds of not invariance. Some will be algebraic, some will be geometric, and what's our uh, well, what's going to be our prediction here? We're going to actually try to predict the signature. Okay. So our data set consists of a bunch of knots. We can, uh, for each knot, uh, tabulate a vector uh, of knot invariance. And we can, in particular, one of those knot invariants uh, will be the signature. And, we, and our job is to try to predict that signature from the other knot invariants. And like the image classification problem for MNIST, we're going to regard this problem as a classification problem. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because even though the signature is a number, it's an integer, and we're not so interested in whether uh, wrong answers, uh, you know, how close they are to the correct answer necessarily. You know, if the signature is 1.2, that error of point two maybe isn't so meaningful. What we really care about is whether it predicts it's one or two, say. And so um, all our predictions really should just be integers. And so uh, we will make it a classification problem. Okay, We're trying to um, categorize knots by their signature. So it, f it falls into a similar uh, paradigm as the MNIST example. OK, so. Let's take a look at this again at a higher level. What I just described for you is what's known as supervised learning. Okay, what that means is that um, we're going to assemble data into two buckets, a train set and a test set. And what we're going to do is we're going to optimize our neural network parameters theta for performance on the train set. And we're going to show it all these demonstrations, all these examples from the train set. And the idea is that once we're done with that procedure, the neural network should generalize to the unseen test set. So then we're going to evaluate the neural network on unseen test set. So that's, that's the paradigm of, of supervised learning. You, you, you supervise it you, you, with the uh, data that you um, have curated through the training data set. And the hope is that uh, it will learn the concept as validated by its performance on the test set. OK, so now that we've described the overall picture of supervised learning, let's actually uh, go deeper into the actual uh, workings of what a neural network uh, is. So we're going to look at the simplest type of neural network, uh, but that's the one that DeepMind, in fact, uses. Uh, it didn't need to use a very fancy uh, architecture, in fact. So the fully connected network, FC for short, can be described as follows. Okay, so it's really a sequence of Nonlinear transformations. That's how we should think about it. Okay, so let me call h zero my input x, and what I'm going to do uh, in this neural network is iteratively uh, apply a sequence of nonlinear transformations, uh, composing of a linear part and then a nonlinear part called the activation function. So as a first step, let me just do one step of this. I go from h zero to h one. I'm going to apply a linear transformation and then a nonlinear transformation. Okay, so here this W is called a weight matrix, so that's matrix multiplication. B is a bias vector, so I'm just adding a vector to the output of the matrix multiplication. And sigma is what's known as an activation function. 
So it's a function of a real variable and it's applied to each entry of the vector. So it's applied entry-wise or coordinate-wise. Okay, so that gives us a nonlinear transformation. Oh. And here the superscripts are just indices. Okay, so uh, I can think of uh, H0 as the zeroth layer, and then uh, W0 and B0, uh, they're just the pair of data such that uh, when I um, use them in this manner, I will get the next uh, H, H1, okay? The uh, hidden layer, the sort of um, H corresponding to the first layer, H1, as opposed to the zeroth layer, okay? Uh, there's going to be several steps of this, but let's just focus on on this this particular uh, single step right now. Okay, how are we going to draw this? It's it's useful to draw this as a picture because it illustrates why it's called a neural network to begin with. So let's denote our input space by R n. So here's where x lives. Okay, so each coordinate we think of as uh, a dot here, so maybe maybe n is four in this picture. And then uh, to go to the next layer, okay, maybe it, there are six of these, so now I'm, I'm in uh, R n1, let's call this n0, n1, so n0 is four and n1 is six in this picture. And I'm gonna draw this neural network that I've written uh, in equation form on the left uh, by drawing connections between these uh, black dots that I've drawn. Okay, so I'm going to have, okay, and th they're going to uh, go between all possible pairs of these, uh, these black dots that I've drawn. I should think of these uh, black dots as, as neurons, okay? Each of these, well, actually, sorry, I should think of, let's say, these inner ones as neurons. And these uh, purple lines that I've drawn, I can think of them as, well, they're called weights. Uh, I could also think of them as synapses if, if uh, the analogy with uh, natural brains is, is apt. So if this is the ith component here and the jth component here, then this uh, edge over here is wij because it connects the ith neuron with the jth neuron, okay? So in this picture, we go from the zeroth layer, H0, and we go to the first layer now, H1. And the way we go from uh, the layer is to do this matrix multiplication given by these um, purple lines here, right? Because, uh, well, the formula for matrix multiplication, if I uh, reintroduce the indices, right? So H1 of J is, um, yeah, I guess I'll write it from uh, left to right, is the sum over I of Xi, Wi, J, okay? So indeed, if I also, I'm, of course, using Einstein notation. I'm suppressing the summation, uh, summation when I um, write the i's twice, okay? So we see that to go to the jth neuron, I'm multiplying uh, each xi by a wij, and that's why I draw uh, this uh, link there using the wij, okay? So, so basically, what the picture of a neural network is, it's that it's drawing the linear algebra, essentially, of these transformations. Right? These weight matrices are connecting the previous layer to the next layer. Uh, we don't draw the bias vector because it's simply just a coordinate-wise addition, so it's not that maybe visually interesting. And after this uh, linear or affine linear transformation, we apply this nonlinear function sigma to each coordinate entry. And we need this function sigma because we need a nonlinear transformation. If we didn't have a nonlinear transformation, uh, if we successfully composed these uh, matrix multiplications and vector additions, then we would still stay within the family of linear transformations and not get anything uh, interesting or expressive. So we need this uh, sigma activation function.
Okay, and the typical uh, typical example of, of an activation function, so is what's called ReLU of x, which uh, is just the max between x and 0. So its graph looks like a ramp function. Okay. Right? It's 0 on the negative x-axis and then just the identity function on the positive x-axis. And that is a nonlinear function. It's sort of the simplest nonlinear function you can write. It's piecewise linear. Okay. All right. So we've described um, one step of this neural network, right? We've applied one uh, transformation to go from the zeroth uh, hidden layer, which is just the input layer, right? This x over here, to um, to go to the first one, and we can repeat this procedure as, as many times as we like. So for the DeepMind result, they in fact had a three hidden layer neural network. So what that means is that they composed this uh, a few more times. So you have another set of weight matrices and, and uh, bias vectors. So you apply it, uh, a W1 and a B1. These are independent uh, sets of parameters to get an H2. Then you have an H3. Okay, so now we have um, three additional layers, H1, H2, H3. And as a final step, we have the output layer, which applies a final linear transformation. Ah, oops. <laughs> this is, uh, these matrix multiplications should be applied to the previous layer. So this should be W1, uh, H1, and this is W2, H2. And now this is W3, H3 plus B3. Okay. And the way we would uh, draw this is we now just extend this diagram to the right. Rn2, Rn3, and then finally an output layer, which I'll call R to the C, where C is the number of classes, okay, the number of uh, output predictions. And we just repeat this picture, okay? So you have a bunch of neurons here of N2 many, N3 many, and then you have capital C many. And each of these uh, weight matrices give you uh, more connections, okay? And so on and so forth. Okay. So that's the picture of a fully connected network. And indeed, it, it's uh, inspired by the uh, neural connections in, uh, in brains, okay? So it's, it, it might be a loose analogy, but, uh, but that's why it's called a neural network. Okay, so to summarize, what we have now are a collection of parameters, which we denote simply by theta. It's the collection of these wi's and bi's from zero to three. Okay, and just to complete this picture, so this is the uh, w0, w1, u2, w3, okay? And the output of our network is just this, this entire composition, right? So, so uh, this vector is the, uh, this is actually equal to f of theta of x, h4, right? It's a vector. So, It's a vector in RC, where C is um, uh, the number of uh, outputs. Well, what is that? We can think of it as uh, the maximum signature uh, minus the minimum signature plus one, right? Because the number of predictions we're going to make, right? So why? is uh, in the set sigma min all the way to sigma max. And there are precisely C many of those uh, elements uh, to be uh, predicted. Okay, so 
uh, f of theta of x is in Rc. And how do we think of this uh, f of theta of x? These are, are what are called logits. Okay? And we could think of them as, well, actually, let me put, let me remove the quotation mark. That, that's what they're actually called. They're called logits. And we could think of them as scores uh, for uh, the predicted classes. What are we going to do uh, with these scores? How should we think about them? Well, an arbitrary vector in R to the C, um, that's a little bit uh, maybe hard to interpret. What we're going to do is we're going to convert this vector into a vector of probabilities. So we're, what we're going to do is apply what's called a softmax function to it. Okay, So apply softmax to this output vector. And I'll denote uh, the indices um, of this output vector by lowercase uh, alpha. Okay, so alpha um, runs from one through capital C, say, because there are C uh, classes. So the alpha component of this softmax is the following. We take the exponential of the alpha component of this vector and we simply uh, normalize it by just the sum of all these uh, exponentials. Okay, okay so uh, several comments here. So notice that by taking the exponential, we get a positive number. Okay, And by dividing by this normalization factor, we end up getting a probability distribution. Right. So this is a probability distribution um, over the set of classes, over the labels, over the possible signatures we're considering. Okay, And, and here, I, I didn't mention it in case it wasn't clear, right? Uh, our data set is some finite uh, data set. In fact, for the not theory result, it's, a, it's about on the order of a million. They, they computed um, not invariance for uh, a million knots, and so uh, the sigma max and sigma min are computed with respect to that finite data set. OK. Um, OK. So we have a probability distribution now um, over, uh, over uh, this set. And uh, that's the sense in which our neural network is making a prediction. OK. You feed it an input x, which is the set of invariants uh, corresponding to a knot. Out comes this vector uh, f theta of x. It has capital C many components. You apply softmax. You now have uh, capital C many numbers, which represent probabilities, because they are non-negative. And they have to sum to 1, given our normalization condition. OK, so now we have this output probability distribution. And um, that is basically uh, how our network is making a prediction. It's telling you the confidence it has that a certain knot belongs uh, to a certain class. Or in other words, that the knot has a certain signature in our case. So writing this a little bit uh, more explicitly, I'll just denote this by P sub alpha, so since uh, P suggests probability. Uh, well, there's a, still dependence on theta. So P sub theta sub alpha, this is the probability that the knot, well, the input corresponding to some knot, which is x, um, I should say that the knot corresponding to x has signature alpha. Okay, That's just translating our classification problem into uh, this more concrete statement. OK, so what should be the goal of our neural network? The goal of our neural network should be to maximize the likelihood that a knot has a given signature uh, if that signature is, in fact, the true signature of the knot. So in other words, let me define this quantity called the likelihood. Okay. So what we're going to do 
is take a product over all these um, probabilities where x, i, y, i vary over the training data. I'll just call that uh, d sub train, okay? D for data. So this is the, um, let me back up here. So remember that uh, we had to prepare a training data set, right? And to have a training data set, you need to have labels. So each knot in your d training data set um, has a list of invariants that you pass in. And you already know what the signature is. So that's what this y uh, i is, right? And if the neural network is to perform well on the training data set, what it should do is to, it should maximize the probability that the correct signature, which you know, which you've computed, um, it should maximize that probability, right? Um, if the neural network were uh, completely confident and correct, uh, all the probabilities on the correct signature should all be uh, one, right? Um, uh, assuming that you can uh, achieve that. But, but that's the idea. You want the neural network to have maximum confidence, maximum uh, likelihood uh, for the correct signatures for the knots that you've uh, fed it, uh, that, are, uh, that it's being trained on. Okay, so just writing out what I just said, what we want to do is maximize this likelihood with respect. Theta, and we're going to maximize it using uh, gradient-based optimization. Okay, so I won't go into that, but um, uh, that's—I mean—that's a whole subject in and of itself. Trying to um, find this optimal set of parameters that will maximize this likelihood, um, but let's just uh, leave that aside. Uh, I hope it uh, uh, makes sense that this is a reasonable thing to do. Right? We have a function that depends on parameters. We fed it data. The data gives you some uh, likelihood uh, uh, based on the parameters, and we want to maximize that likelihood because that's intuitively what it means to um, have a well-performing network uh, on this training data. Let me now recast this formulation into a form that's uh, uh, more convenient to work with. So if we're going to maximize this likelihood, That's the same thing as minimizing the negative log likelihood, okay? Uh, why is that? Well, if you maximize a quantity, that's the same thing as maximizing the log of that quantity, since log is monotonically increasing. And, well, maximizing uh, something is the same thing as minimizing its negative, okay? So just by um, just simple logical reasoning, maximizing the likelihood is the same thing as minimizing the negative log likelihood, okay? So what we want to do, therefore, is minimize the so-called, uh, well, this negative log of this quantity that I just wrote up there. And a log of a product is a sum of the logs. Okay, and so this is the quantity that we want to minimize. And this quantity has uh, a, a, very, a more succinct name to it, or a more well-known name to it, which is that uh, it's also called the cross entropy loss. So what we've shown is that training a neural network involves minimizing this cross entropy loss um, computed uh, over the training data. Okay, so uh, let's just summarize what we've done. So at a high level, what we have is we're going to train a neural network by minimizing this cross entropy loss. And then when we're done with that, we want to see if our neural network actually uh, generalizes. And what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate it on the holdout test set. In our case, we're going to query the neural network with some knots that it hasn't seen, right? Pass it into our function uh, f of theta. It's going to output a probability distribution uh, on the space of signatures. And the prediction we're going to assign to it is the most confident of those uh, signatures, okay? So uh, prediction 
is assign highest probability class, or in this case, signature. Okay. And ideally, uh, if the uh, accuracy of this classifier is high, then that means that our neural network does did indeed uh, learn the concept. Okay. Uh, and, and sort of the life of a machine learning scientist or an engineer is to iterate this process until you get good test performance, okay? Because many things can go wrong in this procedure. Maybe you didn't gather a good data set. Maybe your optimization procedure didn't go well. Um, these neural networks are highly nonlinear functions of their parameters, right? Uh, if we just look back uh, at this formula, we see that it's, it's, it's very nonlinear. It's, it, it's uh, the composition of many nonlinear functions. So it's not given that you will be able to find a good optima when you uh, use optimization methods to find uh, good parameters. But that's basically the machine learning um, setup here. You train neural networks uh, uh, using uh, various methods. What you do when you train is you try to minimize this cross entropy loss and then uh, you hope that the uh, test performance is high. Okay, so now that we've covered the basics of knot theory and machine learning, let's go right into the paper and see what the deep mind accomplishment uh, is all about. So let's go to figure one, which outlines the uh, basic paradigm that the paper is advocating. So What's going on is that a mathematician is going to come along and form a hypothesis about certain mathematical objects. Okay, so in this case, F is a neural network, Z is a knot, and we want to form a hypothesis about the quantities X and Y. So Y is the signature of our knot. Uh, it's a particular knot invariant of interest. And X is going to be a vector formed out of some re other remaining set of knot invariants. Right? Our hypothesis is that there should be some relationship between these knot invariants. We're just going to pick one, the signature, and we hope that the remaining ones are expressive enough so that the neural network can learn some relationship between those invariants in X and the invariant uh, given by Y. Okay, so that's our hypothesis. We're then going to generate a data set um, that just computes X and Y over some uh, collection of knots. In this case, it's, uh, it's quite a large collection on the order of a million. But the point is that uh, there are algorithms for computing X and Y. And so we can just uh, uh, use uh, software for generating this data set. So we generate this data set, and then we're going to train a neural network uh, on this data. And uh, we're going to see how well it performs on a holdout test set. And if it does reasonably well, in this case, it was 78% uh, accuracy on the test set, then we are led to believe that there is indeed some um, predictability uh, coming from the quantities x uh, in terms of trying to, um, well, predict the value y, the signature. And well, if there are a lot of invariants, um, we are going to need to get some insight into how this neural network discovered this pattern, this relationship between capital X and y. And that's where we use this uh, attribution technique to see which of the inputs were uh, significant for predicting Y. What we can do is probe the neural network and see which of the inputs, which of the not invariants are, uh, is the network most sensitive to. And the way we can measure that is just to compute the magnitude of the loss with respect to some uh, input direction, right? So um, x is now over the training data. We're gonna take the average of the magnitudes of the loss uh, in the ith direction, right? So, so i is, uh, corresponds to the ith, so xi is the ith not invariant. So the knot, uh, our collection of knot invariants forms this uh, vector capital X, and it's given by, uh, let's say there's n of them, it's given by a vector of individual knot invariants, and we just probe the neural network in each of these directions 
by taking the derivative of the loss function, taking its absolute value, and just averaging it over the training data. Okay, actually I think my notation here, maybe z, I should call things uh, z, right? And all of these are functions of z. Okay, anyways, so that's how we can uh, understand which of the knot invariants are significant. We just probe the neural network to see how it responds, or more properly, how the loss function responds. And uh, when the loss function changes a lot, it, it suggests that uh, that feature was significant because uh, changing it uh, changes the prediction by a lot. So it's a significant uh, uh, input variable. Okay, so once we look at um, the features which are important, then we can hopefully form a conjecture relating, uh, we can form a conjecture uh, relating the significant inputs to the output, right? This is where uh, the mathematician has to come back in and exercise some insight and creativity. Now, of course, the conjecture might be false or uh, incomplete. And so we have to uh, iterate this um, stop possibly uh, many times. We have a conjecture. That conjecture points to us uh, what are some important aspects of the data to look at. And so we might have to reformulate our hypothesis. We might have to uh, regenerate the data once more. We have to train a new model and that gives us uh, new attributions and uh, possibly a new conjecture. And we keep repeating this over and over until hopefully we arrive at a conjecture that uh, the mathematician can finally prove. And so in this sense, the uh, machine learning model is uh, providing creative assistance to the mathematician. Uh, typically, what a computer is doing is just doing some kind of deterministic computation that verifies uh, what the mathematician is looking for, or just generating data. But in this case, it's actually helping the mathematician uh, form a conjecture um, through the pattern recognition capabilities of neural networks. And so th that is a uh, what is being outlined here in this figure one. Let's uh, go into the details a little bit more for our knot theory problem. So here, let's look at figure A. What we have here is this attribution plot looking at the scores, some normalized scores of um, how these individual knot invariants here uh, affect the output. And we see here, for, uh, there are three very significant um, knot invariants. Right? These first three that we see here, they're the most significant of the knot invariants. And that suggests that maybe we should uh, make a plot consisting of these knot invariants uh, against the signature of the output to see what kind of uh, relationship might exist. So over here on the right side, we're going to plot uh, two out of those three against the signature, right? So the signature is the y variable, the output here. And then we have the uh, merid meridional translation, which is the, well, the real part, which is this one over here. And then uh, things are colored by the longitudinal translation. So that's this one, okay. So that's what this plot here, and indeed we do see structure, right? It appears, at least naively, that there is some kind of linear pattern emerging. And this is where things get interesting because I consulted the mathematicians uh, on this project, or two of them at least, Andras and Mark, and I told them, you know, if I was looking at this plot myself, I would have guessed that there's a linear relationship between the signature and some of the quantities here. So actually, let's look at the conjecture that they formulated Right? They conjectured that there is some relationship between the slope and the signature. But if I look at this plot here, I would have guessed that the signature should be related to lambda times the real part of mu. Okay, So the real part of mu is, is, is what's going on here, right? And indeed, we see a family of lines and different slopes correspond to different colors, right? Because the different colors are lambda here. So 
the simplest guess would have would have thought that the signature is really um, uh, a linear function of the real part of mu, where the slope of that linearity is given by this lambda here. And in fact, that's not uh, what's going on if you look at these conjectures, right? Uh, what we see here is that the slope, sorry, that, that the signature is related to the slope. And so we have to uh, introduce a correction term. So the slope, right? So, so instead of uh, lambda times the real part of mu, the slope is the real part of lambda over mu, which can be rewritten as lambda times the real part of mu divided by the norm squared of mu. Okay, so it's it's almost like lambda times the real part of mu, but not quite, right? It has this correction term. And I asked um, Andras and Mark how, how they came up with this, and, and this is actually where uh, the insight coming from mathematics happens um, based on um, heuristics and, and sort of the constraints and symmetry principles relating to these knots, it didn't uh, make sense to uh, the mathematicians to relate the signature and this quantity that I uh, guessed from the, the plot. Rather, it was much more natural to consider the slope for, for mathematical uh, reasons. Okay, So this is actually where it ma uh, matters to have a good inductive bias, to have uh, relevant domain expertise. Uh, knowing the relevant symmetries and invariances of a problem can tell you um, what are sort of viable candidates and what are not. And I'm not a knot theorist, so I don't quite understand why the slope uh, was a viable candidate and not this other candidate. Okay, And the difference is, again, this mu squared in the denominator. But uh, nevertheless, it, it, it was, well, crucial that they have this insight uh, to formulate the correct conjecture in the first place. Also, as an aside, um, Andras and Mark mentioned that uh, there was some attempt to use symbolic regression uh, on this data, and it uh, did not reproduce uh, this um, conjectural form here, right, Re relating the signature and the slope. So indeed, there's actually still quite a bit of uh, domain knowledge required to um, arrive at the right conjecture, even for a relatively nice uh, data plot uh, like this. Okay, so anyways, so the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, insight, big breakthrough was the fact that there was this approximate relationship between the slope and the signature. So that hadn't been known before. So this was already uh, the beginning of an exciting story. Um, but uh, as I said before, one has to possibly iterate a few times in terms of using the machine learning to get at a correct conjecture. And it's precisely... Uh, seen here because uh, this conjecture was actually false, okay? So um, they were able to uh, construct counterexamples, okay? Right here, counterexamples to this uh, initial conjecture. And actually they told me that this was uh, the part they got stuck on uh, the longest time, okay? They looked at this data, they formed a conjecture that isn't so obvious from the data if you're not a mathematician, but they formed an initial conjecture and uh, they were stuck on it for a while until they eventually disproved it. And they had to, uh, well, prove that it that the, the conjecture couldn't be true. You see, the conjecture states this relationship here that there exists these constants such that this bound holds. And, well, for a finite data set, you can always choose the constants sufficiently large such that the inequality holds. But what they had to do was to construct counterexamples that will violate this inequality for uh, arbitrary constants C1 and C2. Okay, so um, a lesson in mathematics is that if you can't prove something, maybe you should try to relax it a little bit and see what you can prove. And in the end, they were able to do that, probably with a few more rounds of uh, iteration. Um, Okay, and uh, by iteration, I mean iteration of the uh, data gathering and training a neural network. Um, but nevertheless, they finally arrived at a theorem which uh, modifies the original uh, conjecture one and um, states this modified uh, inequality. Okay, and also something to note is that the um, 
the attribution plot also uh, is helpful in terms of knowing what this correct conjecture is because we see here that the terms volume and injectivity, the injectivity radius of the knot, what, whatever those are, those are other uh, geometric knot invariants, they also occur in this saliency uh, plot here, right? They are, there is some dependence of the output on these inputs, although a, uh, a weaker dependence, okay? So anyways, so, so this is quite an involved story, but we can see how all the different pieces kind of come together, right? So you uh, train a neural network, you are suggested which of the input features are most important, which of the not invariants are most important. You uh, do some data science, and with some skill, form a conjecture and play this ping pong game where you try to prove the conjecture and if it's false, maybe you have to for formulate a new conjecture. And finally, when things work out, you arrive at a conjecture that you can prove and you get a theorem. So this is the sense in which machine learning helped mathematicians achieve a breakthrough. So I'd like to conclude this video by noting that the innovation in machine learning we discussed is exciting in that it provides a new tool for mathematicians to develop and prove conjectures. For the case of knot theory, machine learning provided the first bridge between algebraic invariants and geometric invariants by training on large amounts of data. It will be exciting to see what other mathematical discoveries arise from machine learning. All right, well, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching.